we are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. Hello everyone, I'm René Filiatro. I'll be your moderator for this panel. Um, the panel is called Leveraging International Cooperation and Canada's Strategic Assets. Leveraging International Cooperation and Canada's Strategic Assets. Um, and we have an excellent uh, group of people here to talk about that. You've already you know, seen one of them here today, Carrie Buck. Stephanie did a great job um, introducing her this morning, but I think it's worth repeating some of the things that she's done in addition to being Canada's ambassador to NATO from 2015 to 2018 and a career diplomat. She was also the lead of several task force is and um, just to name a few, uh, Russia, Ukraine, task force for Syria, Mali, the Haiti earthquake and tons of other humanitarian crises. She was also the, the uh, head of the task force for Afghanistan while I was with task force Kandahar in Kandahar, so technically, she well, in actuality, she was my boss. So I'm gonna try and not pull my punches. I was talking to somebody earlier who said, oh, are you in charge of the next panel? And I said, no, I think Carrie Buck, my old boss, is in charge <laughs> of the next panel. So I'll do my best not to pull my punches. Uh, in addition to Carrie, we have with us um, Sarah Miriam Martin Rulé, c'est ça? Elegant. Um, She's professor at Bishop University and fe fellow non-resident at the International Peace Initiative in New York, uh, Institute rather. Her research focuses on peace operations. She's our UN specialist in a nutshell. And finally, we have uh, Theo um, and uh, you uh, is going to be uh, talking about um, international security, civil wars, armed forces in that context. Uh, he's, in a, he's an associate professor at the Department of Political Science at Université de Montréal, and we're very happy to have him as well. Um, and with that, I think uh, all the... And we're going to start with a few words from everybody. Is that okay? Sarah Miriam, you can start. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's great to meet once again in person after the conference in December. And uh, we are here and I'm really happy. We're mentioning our different networks and obviously our colleagues and friends that are in the room. It's uh, great to have my uh, bishop delegation with me today. So students who were working on their bachelor's degree in the last few years. So we have John Roux, who was uh, there in 2007, 2017. He's on his PhD in Ottawa. We have Barth, Martha, who's at Global Affairs. Uh, Zachary, Lily, Matthew, who are, are uh, working on their master's right now. So our vocation is to train the next generation and... Uh, promote their desire to continue their education uh, on areas of focus of the network. So it's great to meet online and obviously in person also. Theo, a quick introduction, is that it? Yeah, just general comments on, uh, on the discussion regarding uh, leveraging. Okay, so do you want my, my five minute commentary? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. So um, bon, um, so uh, I was asked on this panel you know, to talk about um, Canadian status as a built power and, uh, and, and how to gain a little more influence in the world in which we have to work in uh, a multilateral context. And so a few observations that uh, I'd like to make, and I want to talk about a couple of different ways of gaining influence uh, and about uh, one in particular. Um, as we've, we've seen a lot uh, today, uh, a, a critical tool for gaining influence is, is doing stuff that our uh, partners and allies want us to do and trying to make a contribution for multilateral efforts. We uh, heard a great deal about that this morning um, uh, from Kerry and from Roland Paris. I think it's, it's uh, an extremely important tool. But I think um, beyond that, the, the second tool that I, that I think I, I'd really like to emphasize and um, 
uh, and, and, and try to make clear is the importance for influence of defining what we want and trying to go for it. Um, that's to say that our own policy coherence, which is the theme of, of the next panel, um, and is sort of the theme of the, the entire conference, um, is not only something important to have uh, in order to, 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 to uh, for coherence itself and try to achieve the goals that we set out for ourselves, but it's also a pretty cool, a pretty important uh, tool of, co of influence as well. Um, there is the risk when we don't have uh, relatively uh, set out priorities that we define for ourselves and attempt to pursue uh, in a concerted fashion of um, having relatively scattered policy, uh, of having of uh, going off in in a bunch of different directions that we don't wind up following through upon, um, and of uh, a drift towards a situation in which the contributions that we make to multilateral initiatives take the form of a token contribution um, that uh, that again we we don't uh, we really see through the end, um, or uh, or eventually to. Uh, talking in a way that suggests that we want to make a contribution to multilateral initiatives, uh, but not winding up doing so, All right? The, so the, the vaunted return to peacekeeping is for me, the example that uh, comes uh, most, most clearly to mind as, uh, as, as, um, as setting up a, 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 the, um, as, as indicating sort of a policy in, in, in need of, of, of greater direction. And uh, the, when we define our interests really clearly, when we uh, define uh, what it is that we want and set out some resources in order to achieve them, I think this has some pretty important uh, 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 impacts for the influence that we can have on other actors. Um, it, first of all, increases our credibility because it says we're a player that knows what we want and we're able to, to go out and, and to achieve it so that when we have a project that we'd like to, to set up, it means that other actors have uh, sort of a greater interest in maybe you know, getting on board and being able to um, and, uh, and, and actually setting out to achieve something together. Um, second of all, the, the, the impact that it has is to define for other actors what we want so that if they would like us to make a contribution towards uh, some priority that they have, they know what they uh, can ask, uh, they can know what they can ask from us, and they know what they, uh, they can contribute to, uh, to, to things that we would like, you know, in return, um, and we wind up being a more important partner in that way. And the third impact that I think it has uh, is, is something um, that Carrie alluded to this morning, the sort of forcing function uh, that clear priorities have across uh, government to be able to have different actors singing from the same uh, song sheet, taking initiatives that are, that are really in, in line with a set of, of, uh, of, of policy priorities. So the lesson of all that is really not to put the, is to try to not put the cart before the horse. That's to say, to try not to make the search for influence be uh, sort of an end in itself um, and detach from uh, from the goals that we that we want uh, want to wind up pursuing, um, so I think that there's a risk when we uh, say to ourselves uh, when we're constantly asking the question, well, how can we have an influence, and we detach that from uh, uh, from from the goals that, that, that we wind up having. Um, if we can go a, a little bit further back and think about the times in which this country as a middle power has had its greatest influence, i.e. in the first uh, couple of decades of the Cold War, our power position was vastly different than it is now, and I don't want to deny that. We had way more relative uh, just power resources to, to bring to bear. We were at you know, the center of the key post-war relationships between the United States and, and the UK and France. Um, and uh, so you know, we had uh, a bunch of strengths that you know we're not going to in the future, most likely. Um, uh, uh, so I don't want to deny that. But at the same time, one of the things that I, I want to make I think it's, it, it kind of really comes out of that time is um, our ability to define what it was that we wanted and actually set out uh, to pursue it. Um, the stakes were fairly obvious. Uh, so if we think about you know the, the the legendary episode of the Suez Crisis, the stakes that were on the table for us were not just the destabilization of a really critical region. There were also the relationships among our key allies between the United States on the one side and uh, Britain and France on the other, and the real need that we had as a country to make sure that, that relationship stayed uh, stable. And so our ability to pursue a policy with uh, some coherence and put some resources into it uh, depended to a great deal uh, upon that, and thus our ability to have an influence on the outcome of that situation and uh, on uh, you know the creation of multilateral initiatives um, down the line. Um, so uh, 
I'd like to, I guess, conclude my remarks with a, with a, with a couple of things about uh, capacity building in, in particular was uh, within the Réseau d'Analyse Stratégique, I've been um, the, the lead of the axis, uh, the research axis on capacity building. So it's something I've thought about a little bit um, as a tool of influence, right? Um, and it can seem like a fairly tempting tool uh, of influence because it allows us, again, to contribute to some multilateral initiatives that are, that are really important. We don't do capacity building outside of a multilateral context um, and to gain some influence over, over uh, it, uh, more directly over partner militaries. Um, but it is, in some senses, I think, uh, a bit of a risky tool. It's a bit of a risky tool because we can wind up being tempted to use it in, uh, in situations or in contexts in which we're not terribly invested in the outcome. Um, but and, and so we're not invested enough to want to, for example, commit our own forces, um, but we're uh, invested in a multilateral partnership that we'd like to make a contribution to uh, in order to gain some credibility down the line. And there's a concern, I think, that the capacity building uh, operation that we might uh, go about engaging in winds up being a token contribution that reflects our, uh, in fact, a lack of interest in, in, the, in, in, the, in the situation that we're talking about in, in a way that translates into a lack of credibility for future initiatives. I think where it's worked, where there's a lot of potential for it to work really well is in a situation like Ukraine, where there's a, a very, very clear interest in that the Canada has in building the, the capacity of, of the Ukrainian forces. I think that's uh, fairly clear and I think it's fairly direct. I don't think that we necessarily need to use, for example, the uh, capacity building operation underway right now in the UK in order to gain more credibility with the alliance. We can if we'd like to, but there are reasons enough directly in building the capacity of the Ukrainian forces uh, for us to commit and for us to commit uh, all, um, more than we're doing. Um, and uh, the, the, the temptation to uh, wind up seeing capacity building as something that we do in order to gain credibility with allies is, is there. And I think that we need to be, be leery of it. And when we pursue it in order to achieve a certain outcome, because we have a fairly clear stake in the um, conflict or in the scenario in which we're going about capacity building, that's when I think we can have um, an, not only an impact on the ground, not only an impact in terms of the results of the mission, but also demonstrate to partners um, that we have some follow through and that we're able to take a policy, make it a priority and see it through. So uh, my approach, you know, in, in order to gain, wind up gaining influence within NATO from that, that operation is to really try to uh, rally other partners um, to that operation because we care about it, not because we want to gain influence for other things. Doing so will demonstrate a credibility that can help us uh, down the line uh, within the alliance and within, uh, within this space. So um, that's the kind of thing that I think we uh, can do a little bit more of, and we ought to, and uh, that I think the kind of reflection that we're going through today about what our priorities really are uh, can help uh, if we, uh, as we uh, go forward and try to uh, translate the things that we do into a greater degree of influence. I'll stop there. Oh, thanks. Thank you, CEO. I think the, the, you know, the general point that the name of this panel is leveraging uh, multilateral institutions to increase our status in the world is, to your point, a little bit backwards. The, the intent should be to actually intervene where needed. And Carrie, do, do you want to go ahead with some some yeah. opening remarks? Um, not sure how to approach it, to be honest. Uh, I'm thinking I'm disagreeing with you, but I'm not okay. sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I looked at the title of the panel, I thought, well, how do we influence? So from my experience in doing diplomacy, and I did mostly multilateralism for 30 years. So negotiating in every multilateral fora that exists, except Organization of Islamic Conference, but everything else. So I'll use NATO as my touchstone, but not only NATO. So how did we influence in negotiations? Three ways. You can be a wrecker. Canada is not often a wrecker. It's more fun negotiating, but we don't often do it. You can be a helper or you can originate ideas and you need different assets for those. Uh, we're not off in a record, so I'm gonna park that one, but for helper and originator, you need different assets. More often than not, we'll turn to multilateral fora, plurilateral fora. I can't think of a single thing that started unilateral and stayed that way for longer than a nanosecond. Because we're not a major power, we need to be with others. We need to build out support. It's how you do diplomacy, and it's how you get something to stick, right? 
Um, so Canada benefits when crises, um, I'll talk security, are multilateralized, gives us a seat at a table and in structured bodies like NATO, a voice and a veto. So is that leverage an end in itself? I think it is in a way. And I think it is in a way because influence you're building so that you can engage in specific transactions or initiatives, but you build that influence so it's like an insurance policy. So you have it when you need it. You have those networks, you have the knowledge when you need them. So when the next crisis hits, because we are in that world of strategic surprise, you can activate the networks. You can identify where the gaps are and what the possibilities are for Canada to either lead or to follow. And I actually think followership is okay. In a way, Lester Pearson did Canada a real disservice because now we look back at that and he was a man who knew diplomacy. He knew the players, he knew the issues, right? We don't have a lot of those now. So he led, he got the Nobel prize. So now we look and that the perpetual conversation in Canada is where are we gonna lead? Seriously, sometimes we will lead. More often than not, we'll follow and that's okay. Um, so where do we lead? Where do we follow? It is all for a purpose, I think. Um, or what do we lead with? Put it that way. And what do we follow on? I think our strategic assets, I've got three of them, ideas. We do best when there are tables, if we want to lead, where we lead with ideas, not always assets, but ideas, and we construct tables and states come to them. So what are those tables? Landmines, easy. Violence against women, easy. Maternal and child health under uh, Prime Minister Harper. We bring those ideas, then we bring the money to the table and the expertise, but we lead with ideas and we build out. Well, what assets do you need to have ideas? You need to prioritize knowledge and networks, right? Um, you need to understand what Canada's longer term strategic goals and interests are, thus the attraction of a foreign policy. And you need a network of professional diplomats to be able to identify those opportunities and start to build them into shifts in policy and to actualize them on the ground. In order to make that happen, um, to be able to generate those ideas, there are a few things I would say that the government should have in place. A better futures capacity. What is the world gonna look like 10 years from now? What do we want to avoid? What futures do we want to create? That capacity has been taken over by the urgent. Second, integrated regular threat and risk assessments. Need to put people offline when there's a crisis. Right now on the Ukraine war, there should be a couple of brains sitting offline saying, okay, what does Ukraine need to rebuild economy, justice, uh, et cetera? And what can Canada bring to it? Um, that's just one example. So you need those things in place. You can have the forward vision of what our strategic goal is and then start to populate that with ideas. I think there's a really good report from the Institute on Governance about the gutting out of our policy capacity inside government, our capacity to create ideas. Second thing you need, partners. Canada's international personality is really good for this. We're used to building bridges. Our, it sounds trite, but our multiculturalism is a real asset. Uh, we underuse it in diplomacy. We're better able to um, understand others' perspectives, better able to create cross-regional groupings than almost anyone else. Um, but the thing that's missing now that we used to do better on is those partnerships inside Canada, which leads back to generating ideas. Most of the examples I just gave you came about violence against women, landmines, et cetera, because there was really tight coordination between people inside, academics, activists, NGOs, and ideas were more organic. And I find we've closed ranks inside government. And I think we're really missing out. And the last thing is on presence, presence in international organizations. We don't do a great job of getting our people inside the UN, inside NATO, everywhere else. Uh, presence in regions. We show up in Asia, we go away again, we show up and then we complain that we're not invited to certain tables. And then understanding when we lead and when we follow. Defense assets sometimes will lead, Latvia. Latvia was an instance of an idea that was cooked up abroad and then brought back home to make real. 
it was not logical that we would lead the battle group in Latvia, not at all. But we did, why? Because knowledge networks, diplomats on the ground uh, in Brussels, me, uh, identifying opportunities for Canada and building them into something real, right? So that's an example. Um, so sometimes we'll lead, but other times followership I think is okay. AWACS, uh, K4, we've got five troops. I don't know how many troops left in K4 and Kosovo, five, right? Still, um, I still think it's worth it keeping that oar in the water when we're following, I think that's fine. So a few gaps I see in um, what we're doing, we, I'm not we anymore, what a government is doing, a few gaps that I think could be filled because we've got a really good Canadian history, uh, Canadian personality and Canadian core skill sets that we need just a little refreshing, a little more opening up to the outside world. And I think we've got the chops to lead when we want to lead and follow appropriately but we need a bit more articulation of those strategic interests as well. Thank you, Kerry. Sarah Miriam, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, of course. I'll be speaking in French and English, but to pick up on what uh, Theo said, uh, it's important to know what um, what we want. Uh, one of the issues is that sometimes we don't know what we want. We don't know what we don't know that we want it, uh, and that's 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 one issue. And um, and and to add to 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 Carrie's uh, uh, different categories, I think Canada can be a good learner as well, and 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 that's quite key, and especially in the presence. And of course, as um, as Rene was saying, I'm I'm more into the, the peacekeeping, and uh, and peacekeeping was once a, a quite a good leverage for Canada, but it's not anymore. And um, and as you know, in 2016, the, the Canadian government pledged for a, a renewal, uh, a renewed role of Canada at the UN, and notably by reengaging its uh, its peacekeeping activities. And then following Canada's hosting of the International Peacekeeping Summit in Vancouver in November 2017, uh, the Trudeau government announced in March 2018 that Canada would re-engage in UN peacekeeping mission in Mali. Um, it lasted, as you know, unfortunately, only a, a few months. And five years later, uh, of course, Canada's renewed role at the UN has remained timid at best. But Canada has much to offer, but more importantly, a lot to learn by engaging further at the UN and in peace operations more specifically. And Operation Presence uh, bore well its name because by being present, Canada can learn more. Canada can signal its engagement in burden sharing and also build new ties. We are talking about, Kerry was mentioning the importance of trust and network. Uh, it can reinforce, reinforce current ties, of course, but, uh, but building new ones. And of course, thereby honing its own understanding and its own capacities. Um, but right now, Canada is, is almost gone from peacekeeping. And I will refer to, um, to Dr. Walter Dorn's uh, website, excellent website, who's tracking the pledge uh, from the Canadian government from, uh, uh, from his endpoint. And he highlights that as of 2022, uh, Canada's personal contribution to the UN peace operations is at a low record of 54 personal, 18 women, uh, 36 men, and the bulk of the deployment being in Mali with 15 personnel, eight uh, male and seven and females. Uh, and he also details that police contribution reached the lowest point since 1992. So what explains this lack of motivation and why should Canada engage into UN peacekeeping? One image that I liked is uh, is viscosity, and viscosity by, by, might, might be one way to put it. And I draw this term from Daniel Dresner, excellent piece, uh, the viscosity of global governance. And, and Daniel Dresner explains the concept as follows, that in fluid mechanics, viscosity is the resistance a material has to change in its form. So high levels of viscosity imply a material that is slow to change. And in global governance, high levels of viscosity would mean a lots of internal friction. 
And I borrow this term today to discuss how um, in Canada, there seems to be a viscosity which have prevented a country's return to peacekeeping as it was announced by the prime minister in 2016. So viscosity would explain why we're not back because there are disagreement over what peacekeeping is, what it should look like and what Canada could gain or lose from contributing. And viscosity in this regard would be twofold. On the one hand, a resistance due to disagreement inside a government on how and how much to engage further into peacekeeping, which leads Canada to being at a record low in terms of true contributing countries uh, to, um, to UN missions. And on the other hand, a viscosity which manifests in the rhetoric, a discourse in which these same debates and, uh, and dissension um, slows the adaptation to reality. So a resistance to change the perception and the discourse to match with the reality that Canada is not only not back, but it's indeed more absent than ever. So a viscosity of rhetoric that lead Canadians to still self-define or self-perceive as being as close to peacekeeping concept and reality. And here we can refer to an excellent survey conducted by Jean-Christophe Boucher, which uh, explored Canadians' attitude on foreign and defense policy issues in August 2020. And in this survey, he showed that 74% of respondents were supportive of Canadian participation in peace missions, and that those who were in favor uh, were 55 years old and older, pointing to the fact that younger generations were quite far less enthusiastic. So I'm summarizing. I'm sorry about all of the nuances that you see, but that's pretty much it. But yet Canada's engagement in UN peacekeeping mission is consistent with its interests, resources, and capacity. And, and then I, I will uh, refer to... Um, to a study we did with uh, uh, Stephanie, uh, in which uh, we both listed a series of reasons why Canada should be back in peacekeeping mission. And the first one being that, uh, well, peacekeeping missions work. We can discuss this, of course. I'm uh, I'm aware of some nuances if you look at what's happening in Mali. But but studies do show that peacekeeping works. So it's a, it's a successful enterprise. And of course, Canada presents unique characteristics and comparative advantages that we've been discussing since this morning in terms of languages, bilingual troops, gender, cultural awareness, technical, uh, technological contributions, capacity. Uh, we're no stranger to debates on burden sharing in the NATO context that was mentioned by Kerry. And, uh, and we're well positioned to address uh, UN's most pressing needs in the context of peace operations. And indeed, there are uh, uh, current gaps that are that are identified uh, that would be well needed. So in terms of capacity, Canada can contribute with the technology, logistics, aerial support. And there are great needs in that area. Uh, just this week, there's an article in Le Monde that revealed that UN mission agencies and humanitarian organizations were seeing their transport obstructed after planes and helicopters were banned from flying by civil aviation because of their Russian licenses. So following san sanctions against Russia... One of the measures of the civil aviation was to cancel contracts with uh, Russian clients. So Russia retrieved aircrafts, gave them uh, uh, Russian registrations without complying with the criteria, criteria of the civil aviation. So since September 15th, uh, peacekeeping missions were instructed to stop loading Russian aircrafts till further notice. But Russian commercial fleet, with, under contract with the UN, represents 22% of the fleet. So in terms of training, uh, Canada has less ex, uh, United Nations expertise, but we can professionalize uh, armed forces police. We have capacity to make uh, great things that we could uh, leverage in big organizations, we can invest in key sectors like what has been mentioned uh, in the role of women and the ELSI initiatives. But more importantly, I'd like to underline, and we talk about that less. Canada has much to learn from allies outside of NATO to work in a multinational environment, um, enabling it to hone its own practices and understanding of complex security envir environment as well. Um, by being present, uh, by having the opportunity to work with other member states uh, to uh, foster new ties, new trust as well, new partnership, Canada can learn uh, other priorities, other interests, uh, have a deeper understanding of different types of threats, but also different types of means to address those threats as well. And, um, and by being present, not only can they foster more ties with member states, but also interpersonal ties that can actually benefit the experience of the personnel that are deployed and that can come back uh, with lessons learned and, and by a higher knowledge of, of what is happening. 
So Canada has everything to win to to being involved uh, more in maintaining of peace because uh, the peace operations work, but for the process in itself to be present, to participate in peace operations, being humble, we have a lot to learn. And of course, by uh, improving our own practices on a national level. Thank you. A whole laundry list of things that we can do. It's to your point and and backed up by the study and virtually every every poll there is, it's on brand. Canadians expect it. Um, Theo, you mentioned, you know, uh, of course, the vaulted return of peacekeeping that didn't happen. I think uh, you mentioned the 2016 announcement that was actually announced like, three times. Uh, and in one of those announcements, and I think I can speak to this because it got picked up by Murray Brewster and Paul Wells without getting thrown in jail for saying it, but we were demarched on that, um, on, on saying that we would feel the rapid reaction force that we never did. Uh, it got some press, but one could describe the attention and the response as a collective sigh of resignation. Um, Theo, how bad is that? When you look at our credibility within multilateral institutions and the influence that we are saying we want to, to hold, um, and yet we, we hear these, these, ter- these numbers that, that don't speak to actually doing what we say we're gonna do to the point where we're being demarched and at this point, nobody even really being surprised by that. Yeah, I, I think that's a big problem. I, I don't want to exaggerate it because there were contributions that we made. You know, I think the provision of C seventeen of a you know of a C seventeen and the the flight hours to the French Operation Mali was I, I, something as as Jean Christophe mentioned this morning, um, and uh, as as Carrie's mentioned as well. You know, gained us uh, did we did France a solid, and we can ex- we can hope to expect something in return. So I don't I don't want to go too far. You know, um, I think that the I guess what where I think it's important to kind of res- resolve it down to is um, let's not talk as though we're going to do a bunch of stuff that we're not actually going to do. And if what we can contribute is the offer of seat 17, great. I think you know that can be something that you know if if that's a a measure that we're really really willing to stick through uh, and to and to and to offer and to uh, and to contribute. Um, I, I then I think that we can gain some influence from doing so, have an effect and uh, help to advance some important foreign policy goals. It's, uh, it's just that we need to be pretty clear about how important the operation is for us both directly and, bo- and in terms of um, the, the partners that we're engaging with and attempting to help, um, what their uh, needs are and what we're willing to provide. Um, and if uh, our words run well past what we uh, are actually willing to do in terms of a, of a clear understanding of, uh, of our interests, both directly and with regards to uh, contributing to a broader uh, multilateral effort, um, I think that there is a risk of a loss of credibility that allows uh, partners to start to say, when we propose something, you know, when we start to, talking, uh, to talk a big game out about other issues, that allows partners to wonder, uh, does Canada really mean it? Or is this another thing along the lines of the return to peacekeeping? How seriously should we take it, and uh, how much should we actually get involved? So I think that there's some. Uh, it, it's um, it, it's really the risk of our words running uh, running uh, sort of well past what we what we're actually willing to contribute that I think uh, causes some problems for us. Harry, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think there are a couple of disconnects that were hampered by um, inside government. Uh, first, there's vertical, relatively slow decision-making that works when you're dealing with a domestic policy issue um, because you can plan it, you move it up, you get your cabinet decision, off you go. With crises, fast-moving diplomatic initiatives where you need to, if you're out in the field, you need to know you've got the political space to carry something as far as you can to secure Canadian leadership. You need answers earlier than our decision-making structures are, are prepared to give. We're not structured. Thank God we didn't get onto the Security Council. Um, <laughs> 
kidding. So I think <laughs> I think the Just word kidding. viscosity is 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 a useful one. We're not the only ones who struggle with this, you know. Other close allies struggle with it, but it's something we need to be aware of, um, and it requires a little less space between the political level and the bureaucracy when you need to move something fast. So that's the second disconnect in that um, the way announcements work is if you under promise over deliver and in order to achieve that all the homework has to have been done before and if there's too much of a disconnect between the political level and the bureaucracy or if the bureaucracy is afraid to speak truth to power you don't get that and that's where you end up in the situation where announcements are made that aren't going to be implemented because they're not possible to be implemented um and this is not this government this uh, alone a uh, previous government for sure government before government before it's it's right but it, I, I think it's getting worse that space and i blame the bureaucracy more than the political level where uh there's not that truth to power it's dangerous i think um and i'm not alone thinking this uh something needs to uh kind of a this is why i propose the um impact the positive impact of a foreign policy review is to start to rebuild those conversations and start to rebuild the expertise and the courage to speak truth to power it's really really important so on peacekeeping you know should it be measured by the numbers i don't think so i don't think that's canada's space on peacekeeping it, it command training bring back the pearson peacekeeping center that had a great international rep. It was an asset. Um, you know, there's all sorts of spaces Canada can regain on peacekeeping. It doesn't have to be troop numbers, and I don't think it should be personally. So some thoughts about things we can fix. I'm not all désespéré. I think that Canada has tools, has history, has skills, but uh, perhaps we need to give them more value. Remember who we are and what we can do. Yeah, it's in, interesting. This question of of um, being held accountable to what what's being said, and and not saying more than yeah than you're going to do, and the accountability side is not there either publicly or within the government right now. Um, if I can pivot just a little bit, Carrie, and indulge uh, a question that's a bit more topical, but it's within sort of your uh, former role as, as ambassador to NATO. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the Indo-Pacific this morning. Um, we talked about the fact that Canada is sailing, you know, uh, frigates through the strait along with our American uh, partners. Um, we're obviously continuing to participate in uh, Neon. Uh, I think technically those frigates were reinforcing United Nations sanctions on North Korea. Uh, so we're doing things. Um, is there a way when we're looking at leveraging institutions uh, specifically related to NATO, um, there's been a bit of discussion around an Asian NATO. Is that uh, realistic or feasible or is that just chatter around the NAC table? Um, so the advantage of an Asian NATO goes back to my first point about leverage and sharing risk and sharing obligations. Right. So in a perfect world, maybe an Asian NATO would be a great idea as a counterbalance to a growing uh, belligerent hegemon of China, maybe. My personal view is that um, a collective security alliance such as NATO in Asia isn't going to happen. It's not in the cards. And even though NATO is starting to look more um, closely at Indo-Pacific and working much more with Indo-Pacific partners. So at the Madrid summit, you have for the first time leaders, uh, leaders of the uh, Indo-Pacific attending this summit, um, that uh, there's no world in which any kind of NATO guarantee would start to travel east. But that doesn't mean there's no multilateral solutions in Asia. I think that uh, the way to look at multilateral solutions for Asia is um, through what I would call networked multilateralism, in that it focuses on areas of functional cooperation, um, areas of common interest, using the multilateral organization that makes sense. 
So if you take NATO as your example, and you could run the same analysis for UN, right? But take NATO as the example, what's NATO good at that it could bring to bear with Asian partners? CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological uh, weapons, uh, nuclear defense, uh, disaster response, uh, disinformation, those areas. So NATO could bring certain things to the table, either NATO qua NATO or through NATO allies to bring them out to, to, to Asian states. So that's military cooperation. Um, but then the other way is it's NATO's a political alliance. And so NATO can be quite helpful as NATO in bolstering some of the political, geopolitical security concerns of its Asian partners. So you saw the Madrid summit for the first time talking about China as a security challenge. That was a huge shift. Um, and that's an important political signal. Uh, if you'd look at who's around the NATO table, that's important support to Asian partners. So that kind of networked multilateralism, you choose the forum, you choose the job that suits your security interests. And it's kind of the way I was describing how Canada approaches multilateralism yeah. too, a bit functional, um, but with an overall goal in mind. And, and going back a little bit to military diplomacy and military muscle backing up the political end game. Yeah. Yeah. But here it's not like a military muscle security guarantee. It's yeah. something else, but it's yeah. still there. Yeah. One final question on NATO. Can't sort of walk away from this conference and not mention Finland and Sweden and what they might bring to the table. Earlier this morning, somebody mentioned the concept, I think it was the Major General of Physical Security. Mm. And last week off the record, and a Swedish official received the question that, you know, what are you bringing to NATO? Would you, for example, participate in forward presence? Uh, and uh, this official's response was, we're pretty forward present already. <laughs> So, so it's that question of geography still matters and physical security yeah. and territorial integrity is, is pretty key. So that, uh, you know, and then maybe they're not necessarily coming in, obviously with, they're not coming in with weak militaries. They seem to be doing well in the exercises. Um, what are your thoughts on what Finland and Sweden can bring to the table? Oh, it's a huge gain for, for NATO, in my opinion. So operationally, um, they have a few assets. They've been um, participating in NATO operations and NATO training for a number of years. Um, their forces are at a higher level of capability than a lot of the allies. Um, so they're bringing that, but they're also bringing particularly, you know, Finland, but they're bringing a mobilized population that has a security awareness and a security understanding. And I'm not just talking reserves, but a whole of country approach to security that's really, really interesting and that we can learn a lot from. Um, high North capacity um, and uh, high North expeditionary mission mm -hmm. capacity too. So quite useful, we can work with them. Um, strategic assets, Intel, um, they know Russia very, very well, not just because of their borders, but you know, both Finland and Norway, for instance, they have embedded in bilateral agreements with Russia. They have multiple layers of cooperation and multiple points of contact. And so while Vladimir Putin is doing something that's absolutely abhor abhorrent and sanctions are on against Russia, Russia will be there in Europe um, for a long time to come. And there is an after Putin at some point. And so those countries that come into the alliance that know Russia so well and have so many points of contact, absolutely invaluable. And then on effectiveness of troops, their troops are effective, very effective, but they understand that you need a whole of um, population, which means women should be in your military, gender approach to everything that NATO does. And they've been stalwart allies of ours on that forever. Mm -hmm. So it helps with the political weight of NATO. There's, there's, I, I don't see a downside at all. The Swedish official kind of threw out a number um, that I, you know, I, I think it's worthy of a fact check that 1% of all Swedish uh, fighting age uh, men and women have served in some capacity in a in a uh, peacekeeping mission so the per capita numbers mm -hmm. might be low but mm -hmm. over time sweden certainly has done its part on that on that front uh so it kind of backs up uh what you're saying but from nato back you to the obviously everybody was in new york this week Zelensky. Uh, gave a speech yesterday. Uh, everybody, everybody's seen it. 
Everybody's seen it. He had requests, um, namely just punishment for crimes perpetrated by Russia, the implementation of a special court, and the suspension of Russia's veto right. I know it just happened yesterday, but do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I have a few, a few thoughts. Uh, Zelensky's requests relate to uh, debates and questions on the reform of the Security Council that uh, go back a long time and the formation of the Council itself. Why are there uh, only five member states that have a, a veto? What are the criteria to be a, a member of the Council also? Uh, one thing that I could uh, put forward is as as uh, same same with OTAN, NATO and and UN, uh, it's it's a forum negotiation forum and a tool for negotiation. So both. So it's also uh, on different levels. So negotiations that can happen on the Security Council, of course, they're they're done in a global context. But sometimes negotiations have been made on mandates in. Um, peace operations uh, in Libya, Syria, Central Africa, Mali and Sudan uh, uh, regarding different mandates that allow to compromise on certain subjects so we can get to compromises on other subjects. So I think that uh, it's important to reflect on the way uh, that the Security Council is a space, is a forum, is a, tool, is a negotiation tool for uh, the great powers. It can unlock uh, through compromises and negotiations that uh, need to take place on the Security Council. They can develop other forms of negotiations on other aspects that are not related to the subject that's being treated. So that multi-level game, uh, political science students have read uh, Putnam two-level games, all those authors that talk about uh, this subject. So uh, it's also the case for NATO and uh, other organizations so it, we're going back to the reflection what's the uh, use of the security council but beyond the uh, veto right what is the uh, bargaining power uh, and to, to whom and when and what can be the use a little unfair theo to ask you the same question uh, given that it happened just yesterday but you know sort of what you know, for considering how Canada can leverage or work with multilateral institutions. And here you have an example of uh, something hitting the floor of the UN. How can Canada support Ukraine? Uh, and how do you think, is there any space here for us to respond to the requests from Zelensky? Uh, Keeping in mind what Seta obviously said about reform. I mean, um... I don't think that there's not, I don't think there's a lot we can do to respond to Zelensky's specific requests about UN reform, given the difficulty that we have had in having our own role to play mm -hmm. at the UN and the UN Security Council. Uh, put it this way, it's a, it's not uh, a forum in which we, we um, it does not seem to be a forum in which we've had a, a great run of success recently. Um, at the same time, um, you know, I I think that when we are being relatively clear about the ways in which we are helping out Ukraine, you know, in order to try to and to to bring uh, back to the forefront uh, the UN Charter principle of um, non-aggression, right, and on, on the end of uh, you know the, the the idea that strong countries aren't really allowed under rules-based international order, as Roland Paris said this morning, to attack weaker ones, and the ways in which we are trying to help Ukraine resist, um, a thing that I think that uh, um, uh, that the, the the stuff that we are doing uh, in order to try to help the Ukrainians resist is probably the most important uh, you know, kinds of things that we can be doing right now. Um, in uh, and the way that I think that we can turn that into um, broader diplomatic initiatives, um, it's it's important, and I think it's important to to uh, it can be it's pretty important to use what we're doing on the ground in order to try to reinforce UN principles and to try to uh, show the uh, the uh, to, to try to show the broader uh, international community um, that when Russia talks about uh, sort of legitimate security interests or um, sovereign statehood, what it means is uh, is something you know, rather different and 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 is you know the ability of a of a large country to push around smaller ones. Um, 
then you know I think that that, it, that it's possible to, to to help to push the UN uh, back to a debate uh, or back to a, to a reconsideration um, of some first principles and to recognize uh, the disconnect between the way the Security Council works and the way that uh, it was hoped that it would um, with Russia's veto, you know, which I don't think is going away. Um, there, the the things that that uh, countries can usefully do in the face of that veto, in the face of knowing that plenty of things that it would be useful to do are going to be vetoed, is to keep on bringing them up in order to show that the veto is being used, and in order to show uh, the the ways in which Russia uses its power in order to to, to push aside uh, things that are, I think, very clearly in a broader international interest. Um, so, to the extent that we can uh, try to do that um, from from the outside, the Security Council, uh, we. I, I, I think it would be a useful thing to do. Um, and to the extent that we can rhetorically uh, reiterate the importance uh, of some founding principles of NATO, of, you know, of the UN, excuse me, uh, then I think it's it's worth doing as well. Uh, understanding the limits that, that we have uh, in the UN and in particular in the Security Council. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat related to, to this question, and, and I know, Gary, I've seen you hold press conferences at, at NATO and, um, every multilateral institution seems to take a, a specific posture on, on public commentary and, and, and how forceful or not forceful they would be. Uh, NORAD uh, seems to have taken a very proactive posture where every time there's a scramble uh, because of an incursion into airspace by a Russian bear up north, uh, O'Shaughnessy you know, issues a statement. Um, when we went through the Taiwan Strait, you know, the typical line, both from the US and Canada was that it was the most direct route and um, considerate international waters. Um, what are your thoughts on how important it is to not only do what you say you're gonna do, but then when you actually do something to say it um, and say it clearly, uh, and does that, does that have an effect? Um, to the extent that saber rattling might also be a risk. Uh, anybody, I guess, thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so international organizations are different from states when they make the calculation whether they're going to engage in quiet diplomacy, so do stuff and don't talk about it, versus um, leadership, do stuff and talk about it. Both, both are kinds of leadership. I don't know what to call that second one. And it's a really both tactical and strategic choice that is made when you do that. So at the beginning, the UN Sec Gen was not as visible. And I don't know what the tactical calculus was around that. Um, but it kind of made sense to me when the focus of conversation was on a military response and supporting Ukraine on that military front because the UN can't do much. But when it came to dealing with migrant outflows and food support and food security and some on energy, he was more visible. And maybe that makes sense. Then inside the UN, you were using we were all using different parts of the UN to do different things to counter what was happening in uh, Ukraine and to support Ukraine. So when the Security Council couldn't function, uh, and Zelensky called it out, um, the UN General Assembly could step in. And why is it useful? Because there's a real risk, I think, with this war that it turns into the West and the rest. And that's not a good space to be in for any of those issues the military issue, the energy issue, the food security issue, it's not a good space. So the UN is actually really, really helpful to expand the community that will criticize, right? So do public, uh, not quiet diplomacy, a lot of that's going on, but more public leadership inside the UN. It's very useful to build that support out. Um, Stoltenberg, of course, occupied, Stoltenberg, the sec gen of NATO, occupied more of the beginning space right right after the war started what were his messages at the time support for ukraine but also we're not going in to start world war three and that was a very helpful information space where there was more quiet diplomacy going on was all of the allies giving weaponry to ukraine there's opsec reasons for not talking about it 
also a number of the countries, they weren't sure whether their populations were in that space of sending massive weaponry into Ukraine before the atrocities came out and then perhaps public sentiment might have shifted upwards. But think about if you're a German leader with their Ostpolitik at the beginning, it probably would have been a difficult political space to be in to go out and say, well, we're sending this and that and that and deliver a whole list of heavy, heavy uh, weaponry. I don't know. So you saw a mix of different actors doing public diplomacy, not public diplomacy, being quite visible in their leadership at different stages of the conflict on different issues, and then quiet diplomacy behind the scenes. So from a kind of parsing out what diplomacy was happening, it's, it's pretty interesting case study that someone should do about where multilateralism was used, where bilateralism and plurilateral fora were used, mm -hmm. and for what. Any thoughts on that, Theo? Yeah, is there any, uh, do we have any questions? I think we're sort of at question period time. If anybody has any questions yet, if you want to go down here. Hi, uh, Anvesh Jain, um, emerging scholar with the network here. Uh, this one's probably more directed towards Professor McLaughlin. So I was, in the summer, I uh, talked to an Australian official who kind of you know, we talked about Canada and some of our partnerships and Five Eyes came up and there's, he was kind of making fun of this anxiety in our newspapers about us getting kicked out of Five Eyes. And he was telling me that, you know, nobody in Australia or anybody else thinks that. It's something that seems to come up in our discourse. And, and a lot of the panels mentioned so many of our contributions to the world in terms of BPC missions, building partner capacity, strengthening overseas judiciaries, uh, development missions education, infrastructure, whether that's nuclear or dams. I mean, probably stuff we're doing less now, but historically. And I think it's a question of, uh, are these just our own anxieties? Is it learning to live within our means and our diplomatic capacities and resources as a country? Or do we just need to hire more marketing consultants? <laughs> <laughs> Can I add something to his question, uh, Theo, uh, as it relates to the very same thing? I, you know, we haven't talked about AUKUS today. Um, some believe that it should have been Canaucus, <laughs> and others believe that it wasn't realistic to begin with. Um, same point, how much of this is hand-wringing on our part, and how much of is it, it of our credibility on the global stage is real? Um, well, the specific case of, uh, of AUKUS, I mean, there, there were initiatives, it seemed to me, uh, without being an expert in the region, uh, that the that Australia, the United the United States, and the United Kingdom wanted to pursue together, and that I don't know how much we would have been able to help out with. Um, from that point of view, I don't think that we should have been particularly concerned about it. To the extent that AUKUS involves things on, for example, intelligence sharing that go past uh, what the Five Eyes is doing, and that sort of raise questions about whether Five Eyes is going to be replaced by AUKUS by the three, well, by three other key players. And it can be a little bit of concern about it, but it doesn't seem to me, I, I think that there's still benefit, uh, there's still a pretty clear benefit uh, to those three players for, um, for Canada and New Zealand being involved. So I, I guess I'm not uh, con particularly, con you know, worked up about it. I think this may be a situation in which we get really concerned about our status. We get really concerned about, uh, oh, this looks like a slight, is it? I don't know. I think we had as many concrete issues on the table as, say, for example, France did with AUKUS, right? Uh, so, to my mind, um, you know, I think that if we, if we're trying to, I mean, the the wrong reaction would have been to say, "Hey, guys, we can do subs too," and like to 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 you know get involved in that space just because we wanted to be involved in the club. It's a bit of an extreme, like it's a bit of sort of an absurd uh, scenario in which we'd wind up doing that, but. Um, it, that that kind of thing would have been would like to have a, a response too motivated by our concern for status would have been a problem. You know, at the same time, there is a balance. It says, as 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 Carrie's mentioned, and 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 I think quite rightly, you know, we need a seat at various tables, right? Um, I don't see AUKUS as preventing us from having a seat at a number of relevant tables, particularly. Um, it, uh, and it, it is good to invest in presence in, in a lot of uh, in a lot of different uh, fora, but I think there's a question about what we would need in order to do that. And in this specific instance, I, it, it doesn't strike me that we have uh, a whole lot that we would need to uh, that that, that we could uh, bring to the table that would allow us to to make it into a canarchus and uh, uh, that and that just just doesn't seem to me to to make sense in a cost benefit framework. I'd like there. Yeah, Carrie, you talked a little bit about 
presence. You've mentioned presence as well. How important is that as it relates to, to the same question? No, I think I think we're pretty Canadian. Somebody said on the second panel that we keep beating ourselves up and we can't have a FOMO foreign policy. Um, you know, every time we're not invited to a club, there's hand wringing in the press. And I think it's, it, it, is this something that meets our strategic interests where we bring enough to the table and where it means enough for us to invest? Sure. But otherwise, so I, I was not fussed when I saw it. And I actually didn't see a lot of hand wringing from inside government. I saw it more mm -hmm. in the media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think France probably took a lot of the air to the media. Yeah. As well. And they did have more interests and they'd been through yeah. a rockier time on those issues. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions? Any looking to see the online person? Where are they? No. Uh, all right. Right here. Did you have a question? Nope. Sorry. Didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> right here, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you. Really interesting uh, discussion and very different angles that you're all bringing to the table. So I like the complementarity between the panelists. And I, you know, I am privy to some of the questions that were circulating in the preparation to this mm -hmm. panel. So there's a, a few things I'm still wondering about. And since uh, the door has been opened with AUKUS and several mentions of the Indo-Pacific, I think I'd you know, I'd just like to pick your brains because one of the areas where we struggled and Sarah Miriam uh, and Theo will notice because we discussed several drafts of the report we discussed this morning during, you know, monthly meetings. And, and one area that was particularly difficult, uh, two areas were particularly difficult, how to represent Canadian ambitions within the UN and peacekeeping. And uh, we had a bilateral exchange uh, with Sarah Miriam on how best to represent that and how much space to dedicate to that in the report. And um, I sort of want to get to give Sam an opportunity to, to maybe uh, share that rationale with, with uh, the broader group, because I thought it was really interesting. But I think it is, we, we keep on talking about the past when we talk about peacekeeping, and I'd really love to you know, identify the solution space for Canada within that setting so that it's a credible player, but not trying to do things where realistically it, it can't catch up like the numbers game. Uh, so that's the first point. The second area where we had a really hard time was the Indo-Pacific and how to define Canada's role in that space. And it's clear that Canada has interests there. So it's not about complete retrenchment or not being invested, but we were also conscious of the limitations with with regards to Canada's credibility and diplomatic uh, presence and reach there. And so, you know, if you wanna have that, that influence and that credibility, there's a lot of work up front that you have to do and we just didn't feel Canada was there yet. And I'm wondering, is military involvement and investment necessary to protect Canadian interests in the Indo-Pacific right now? Can And can we also say maybe that's, that space is, covered by by our allies there's south korea japan the united states australia new zealand like they are credible credible and present players there does canada need to be there uh and follow in that particular context and i i heard really con uh, interesting contrasting perspectives this morning from from you carrie and certainly from roland as well and I'm, I'm persuaded by those points but i think it's still like a thorny one to 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 find a solution for because we we know Canada is a Pacific country we know a certain level of investment is needed but is it going to be through military means or can alternative strategies secure protect those same interests as that um, regional space continues to evolve very rapidly sorry that's a very long-winded questions slash comments but uh, would really love to hear your views on that do you want to talk about uh, the question of UN? Yes, in, in, the, in the report, is we, don't, we do not mention the UN a lot because we didn't reach a consensus. And I want to pick up on, uh, on the question of, of numbers. I agree with Kerry and Theo that it's not a question of numbers. And for many reasons, I mentioned uh, we have very few troops, 54, that's not a lot. But if we uh, go back to the point that was made this morning, the importance of logistics or uh, disconnects, 
We cannot have many more. We don't have the critical mass to send uh, tr troops to the UN, so that's not our strength to send people like in the 90s to send a lot of troops, but rather, and I'm picking up on what uh, Kerry uh, are, we should have niche contributions uh, uh, within our specialties to what, what we can offer. Uh, I, thinking about uh, Zachary, uh, Zachary participated in a mission in, in Mali, the support that we can bring in terms of uh, medicine, aerial logistics, and certain specialties that we're developing and technologies that we have in Canada, we're developing an expertise that we could um, offer to peace uh, missions that could be useful and choose our strength our expertise and put that um and to put that to the, to the service of uh, of peace operations and uh w without looking at numbers and i think that uh coming back to training should be pretty useful because once again there's the uh, linguistic side that works well. We all, all uh, we also have the police that underused. Our police have, has a lot of experience uh, in Haiti, a proximity police that could have a short-term impacts that could be uh, visible. I'm thinking about uh, maybe if we had uh, police in Central Africa, for example, that that would be an expertise that we have in Canada that's uh, unrivaled as far as our capacities and ways of doing things. Um, so focus on what we are good at and, and, and being present also once again. So we cannot neglect uh, the learning experience when we are deployed with other uh, state members to see how they work, to see their capacities and how to improve our practices with these new networks that we can create uh, just by being uh, present in the operations. Thank you. Back to Indo-Pacific. I think just to add, a, a, if I may, a, a guiding question to, to, that, to that larger question is, I think for any country in the Indo-Pacific, uh, what's the value of allying with us versus China? I mean, it really does come down to fundamentally uh, what value do we bring, what interest do we bring um, to nations in the region, maybe. I don't know, just sort of a, some thoughts around, around the question on Indo-Pacific. I, I, I can start. Um, is the military space covered by our allies? Yeah, absolutely. Do we need to be there? I don't think so. But with our allies, we buy something by contributing. And the thing we buy, it isn't really credibility. We have that with our close allies. We have that credibility. It's a capacity to influence the direction some initiative will take. And it's also visibility. We're part of that effort to counter uh, belligerence um to deter belligerence that kind of thing so so it's giving us something um but i'm not ever arguing for us to be there in a big way necessarily not in the current conditions but to be there militarily in a way that goes beyond humanitarian assistance for sure mm -hmm. but in order for that to be effective we have to have a more continuous and a bit more activist diplomatic presence and i think we've been a bit one foot in, one foot out, one foot back in, one foot back out, including at the ministerial level when you look at some of the major fora. So um, over the years, and again, it's not, it's the past at least two governments. Um, so I'm not, I'm not making a point about current, it applies to previous as well. Uh, so I think it needs a little more consistency on the diplomatic front and probably a bit more presence. And we have assets to capitalize on. We've got a long standing relationship with South Korea, for instance, that dates back to the war and there's a lot of appreciation and we kind of occupy a similar diplomatic space in South Korea, you could see doing more on that front. And we have not perhaps invested as much in that relationship as we could. Japan, we sit with at the G7. So we've got, we've got, and we've got diaspora too. So we've got these kind of ins mm. that we can capitalize a bit more on. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, we don't have to lead. That's a question of clear followership, but I do think it's military deployments as diplomacy is what mm. we're talking about. 
And and the Shangri-La dialogue is a bit of a canary in the coal mine as far as commitments of governments over the years that our presence even at the you know, national security dialogue of the region has been spotty, yeah. up and down, up and down. Yeah, yeah. APEC, um, et cetera. So, yeah. you know. Anything to add? Uh, I guess I would, I, would, I would say that I don't think that, um, again, I'm not a specialist for the region, but what I understand is that I, I actually, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that it is a matter of, of, of choosing to align with China or with us. And I don't think that we have too much of an interest in trying to make it that way or to, yeah. to, 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 to push that uh, angle of, of seeing things. Uh, states in Southeast Asia have to deal with China. They're going to be right mm -hmm. next to China uh, for a very, very, very long time and would prefer not to have to choose, I don't think. I think mean, that's been the, the approach of ASEAN, uh, for example, and... Um, I don't think that we that that our approach should be trying. We should be competitive in the sense of saying like, here's what we bring to the table, and China doesn't. Um, but here's what we're trying to con contribute in order to uh, maintain uh, a, a, a Pacific in both sense of terms status quo, right? Like a, like a, like a relatively, you know, like a, a, a situation where you know we're we've got a you know we've got a relatively uh peaceful uh region and and what we're trying to do to help maintain that um at the same time as pursuing some fairly you know uh clear interests as as, as we said in 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 maintaining um you know maritime transit and the free and open indo-pacific um so in terms of the military tool i'd say that there there certainly isn't um we don't have much interest in pulling back what we've already been doing so there's the extent that we've been yeah. engaging in transit uh engaging in um uh, joint exercises uh in a rim pack and so on i i think it's it's a thing that if we're pulling back from those things it sends the wrong signal yeah. for sure um and so that's going to need some investment because you know just it it, it, it even if for no other reason than to maintain our uh, military capacity to be able to carry on doing the things that we've already been doing. Um, beyond that, though, um, I'm a little agnostic as to what our uh, an increased military presence would actually uh, gain. And I think that the as as we've said, I think that the 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 real movement or the real action needs to be a little more on the diplomatic and economic side. Yeah. So we have a question from James Cox online. Uh, if government were more open about what it is doing abroad, particularly by providing a clear articulation of our objectives, would it not serve to better educate the public and media so both can engage in more confident and mature discussion about our global actions? Well, I think he's preaching to the choir, I'm sure, as who would like to go first on that one? I have a couple of things. I, I, sure. Broadly, I agree with one with a couple of exceptions. Um, some of the time, particularly when we're investing in partnerships, as I, you know, as I think, and by the way, Carrie, I think that we we agree on a lot more than we think at the, at the outset. Um, but when we're going ahead and saying we're contributing, for instance, uh, to uh, the French operation in order to be seen to be doing them a solid and get something back from them, like if we're going out and saying that, it's not going to really be super effective. Well, there's some pretty there's some pretty clear drawbacks to being terribly clear about what we're doing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so we we have to we I think we have to like, I think the government is going to massage that and I think that that's probably the right thing to do um, so that the so that our policy doesn't seem to be overly transactional um, so there's limits to what we can do about that I mean, there was a discussion this morning that was very very interesting about um, thinking about uh, various problematic scenarios in the United States and what we would do about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that we should be engaging in that kind of thinking, and I also would agree that the that uh, that the, if the government of Canada is too clear that that's what we're doing, then we're going to or that 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 that, that, that overly clear messaging can be a bit of a problem uh, when it comes to dealing with some really really sensitive uh, issues about the future. Um, at the same time, as I think we owe it to ourselves to plan for a situation in which the United States really pulls back on its leadership, for example, or stuff really hits the fan uh, politically uh, to the south of us. So I think we have to be preparing for it, and I also think that it's important to uh, to think that we have to. Um, 
that we have to be very cautious about how we talk about that, how about how, about how the government talks about that public. So I say we, I'm not part of the government, so um, they can decide what they're going to do about it. Um, I'm going to carry on thinking about it uh, myself and be pretty open about it, but uh, I would understand if the government didn't want to uh, do it itself. Um, beyond those exceptions, I do think it would be nice to be a lot clearer about what it is that we mean to to achieve uh, and to and, and for the government to, to have a, a much clearer articulation of its priorities and to be willing to not talk about certain things as priorities when they are not. Um, so as to not sort of create confusion about the foreign policy that it's attempting to pursue. And mindful, of course, of the brilliant comment somebody made earlier about tone deafness. The key is, in a lot of ways, communicating it in the right way that respects the audience that, you know, Canadians are wise and um, governments underestimate that at their risk, I think. Um, Can I make one absolutely. parochial mean comment too? Um, <laughs> we have to be careful not to do foreign policy by announceable. Yeah. Mm. Right? So you announce money for something, great. Why? What are you achieving? Why are you doing it? What's the goal? It's a, in a way, it's a, that, that's why I'm pumping for foreign policy review. I actually don't think it'll change much in terms of our priorities, but it will at least set out those high level objectives. And then that's the high level objective against which you can measure the specific initiative that, you know, ha you have to leave space for specific initiatives to, to be created and move quickly and for Canada to have that space for diplomatic creativity. Mm -hmm. So you should never have a foreign policy review that articulates we're gonna have you know, 75 peacekeepers and this and that. You need those higher level objectives, um, not the tactics, but the higher level objectives articulated. And then that becomes the framework against which you measure, measure success, um, not the money that's going out the door. I think it relates to, uh, to the, the discussion we had this morning uh, when Stephanie was mentioning uh, the rhetoric. And uh, I think there's something about um, in the questions, uh, if government were more open about what it is doing abroad, there's the way we talk about what we're doing abroad and what we are doing abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's uh, that's politics for sure. And uh, and these are these so serve different purposes as well. The way we talk about what we do and and what we do. So to your, gap. to your point, one purpose, I mean, the UK um, and others have taken a very proactive stance on inoculating against misinformation by communicating proactively to an uh, to an unprecedented level about uh, in some cases intelligence in some cases operational matters never putting at risk those things but but ultimately we're seeing that UK MOD report every day it, it's sort of connected to what you were saying Theo do you see is it feasible that Canada could similarly inoculate against mis and disinformation um, to the to the you know to the the questioner's point that to educate the media educate the public we need to get our narrative in there um, otherwise the vacuum will be filled and it's been by all accounts very successful on the UK's side does Canada have the capacity or even the delegated authority for communicators to do that. I would add one thing, which is I think it's not only been useful or been effective on the UK side, but I thought the, the US side was was just terrific and yeah. went up to the war. I, I thought it was so effective. Um, I was really impressed. I wasn't sure quite sure what they were doing at first, to be honest. Mm. I wasn't sure whether it really made a whole lot of sense. But then as the invasion, like when the when the United States was warning about the invasion, yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then when it did, and I thought, oh, well. You know, they they prepared us pretty well and they managed to defuse a whole lot of lines of, of information that were coming from misinformation that were coming from Russia um, at the time. Whether we can do that is a, a question internal to government. We know all about like the very, very long process that it takes to fire off a tweet. Um, and <laughs> it, in, it, depending on, I mean, some government of Canada Twitter accounts can be much better than others. Um, but uh, but you know that that's more of an internal process to which I really can't speak whether we have the flexibility. But I do think it's a it's a potentially interesting tool if we can manage to do it. Well, we have to think whose intel it is too. I mean, it's good for us to be in five eyes, but um, 
we have very limited foreign intelligence collection capacities. And so there would be fewer instances where at least about international crises, we would own something that we could then legitimately use without coordinating with allies or five eyes. That being said, we could maybe do a bit more communicating in line with UK US um, about these things. Um, that might be, and that would be a, a kind of comms intel move that I could see a lot of space for. Um, I think the bigger question for us is around internal communication. So not about uh, international crises, but internal communication to counter disinformation. And there are initiatives inside government that are led on the civilian front. And I think some deep analysis needs to be undertaken about what the CAF does and does not do on countering disinformation. I see no role for the CAF internally in Canada on that front. Um, uh, but it's worth a conversation about what the space and the role is for the military in that conversation and for the security folks. Right now, it's led mostly out of the very, very civilian non-security parts of the government, which I think is correct. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. There are many more players, and I think a serious policy conversation is likely underway. I've left government now, mm -hmm. but uh, needs to take place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're a communicator in government? Yeah. Well, thank you for your service. <laughs> Keep trying to get it out. <laughs> if nobody tells you that, it's very appreciated. Yeah. yeah. I follow great. it. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's great. Um, I, I feel your pain on the approval process. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have actually. Hello. <laughs> now I recognize you. You just you never know when you've seen somebody in a JSAT or something. And um, any other questions? I think we're coming up to the to the last. There's one. Oh, here we have another one. Uh, can we really crap? Oh, sorry. Oh, is there another one? Oh, right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay. Hi, thank you. I'm going to make it very quick because I know that it's, it's been a while. Um, but thank you so much for your for your expert opinions. It's such eye opening for, you know, a lot of me as a student who is still continuously learning about Canada's uh, international cooperation dynamics. So it's been very informative for me, especially to listen to the experts on this issue as well. And I, I sort of catch from this panel that there's a sort of an overarching discussion about for Canada to re-identify itself on the international stage, right? Um, be it whether to refashion its old identity or to find a new one, finding the way back. Um, and I hear Ambassador Buck uh, mentioning, you know, it, uh, sometimes Canada can lead and sometimes it's okay for Canada to follow. Um, and when we discuss Canada's relationships with other states, we often use, uh, you know, terms like Canada-China relations or Canada-Russia relations. And in these kind of discourse, I wonder if when we follow, how do we still make sure that we have a clear understanding of who we are as a follower? And how what are the kind of existing initiatives maybe something that can help us end the panel in a hopeful note on well, maybe what is something that's being done within Canada that's you know we think is a good idea it should be supported to help Canada to better define itself and better define its interest and even relating to the comment on misinformation I think 
ultimately it would be the most helpful for Canada to battle disinformation about itself when Canada knows exactly who it is. Um, so is there any, I, I'm so curious about whether if there's, there's a lot of things that can be improved on definitely, as we can see from this, the discussion of this panel, but I was wondering if there are anything that is being done already that we think we should give more attention to any great initiatives that uh, we should be looking out for that is helping Canada to get to where it is going. Wow. I so, hope I'm not wasting any of this. No, time, I but... think you've just encapsulated that the only way to fight propaganda is not with propaganda, but with the truth, really, and what we're doing. Um, I mean, we've just had somebody say that that uh, they're trying to push out what we're doing, and it's incredibly difficult. I mean, to the panelists, your thoughts on that on that question? You've just asked the hardest question of the day, so yeah. <laughs> And it is a great one, but it comes back to who we are as a nation and how we define ourselves. And so I was, I always thought that part of our uh, challenge is that we define ourselves by who we aren't, right? We define Canadian identity by who we aren't. And, um, but over the last few years, we've started to define ourselves by who we are. Uh, part of that comes from the current government. So that's focus on Canada being a place of tolerance and a place of diversity. And if you depoliticize or departisanize that language, I think that's actually a really helpful direction that we've gone in as a nation. So when I look at our foreign policy, I try not to be a golden age of saying we used to have it better and now we're not doing as well. The fact is the world's harder for us to do it as well now. So it's an external driver that makes it harder for us to articulate. But I do think if we take those ideas that uh, we are actually a re reasonable country, peaceable, tolerant, and functioning, I mean, compared to some of our neighbors to the South, for instance, we're actually doing a pretty good job. And if you can take that and translate that into our foreign policy priorities and help us decide where we're leading and where we're following, I think you'll end up with a good product. In order to do that, we have to collapse that whole distinction we used to have between values and interests, which became partisan in a way, like mushy add-on values that are interests that don't really meet our hardcore security interests. It never actually, we never implemented our foreign policy in practice that way. There were value-laden uh, initiatives under Prime Minister Harper, maternal and child health, even don't uh, go along to get along. That's a value-laden statement, right? And there were hard interest decisions made that weren't mushy human security values, blah, blah, under the previous government. So we've never actually lived that divide between values and interests. I think we need to bridge it. The UK has done that in their foreign policy reviews. So I think there's a space to recraft our foreign policy, but we need a conscious decision to do it. Just as we took that decision to stand on our own two feet post-World War II, we're at a hinge point in history right now where we've got an opportunity to remake it as a Canadian foreign policy that then will help us decide where we follow, where we lead. Won't, won't prescribe it, but at least give us that, you know what it is, it's rebuilding that sense of pride in us internationally. We should have it. We deserve to have that sense of pride, but we're a bit too Canadian, you know, self-flagellation, we need to, which is why I'm, you know, proposing that kind of more robust, comprehensive, integrated review. Well, that's an excellent optimistic note to end on. Thank you, Ambassador Buck. And thank you, uh, Sarah Miriam, Theo. Uh, fascinating discussion. And uh, apologies to the one final question online that we didn't, we couldn't get to in time, but, uh, but there's still plenty of afternoon left. So thank you very much. Thank you.